Well, uh, I'm Brittany Stoneberg from the Western Science Center. Joining me as always is Gabriel Santos from the ALF Museum. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and joining us today is a guest that we are very excited to finally have on the program today, Dr. Christy Visaji. How are you doing, Christy? I'm doing great. So excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs> We've been trying to get Christy on the show for a year now. We have been, we were like, please, please be on Fossil Friday chats. We really want you on our show. I was, yeah, I, I was just waiting to kick off season four. That's what I was <laughs> Um, You know, sorry, give me one second. I need to make sure that we're actually streaming. No sorry, if, if we are. Can you say in the chat? I can't tell right now. <laughs> We've had a few technical difficulties just today. Gabe and I have been away. And so, you know, the technology was like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna mess around a little bit. <laughs> I, th I think okay, no, we are. There we oh, go. Wonderful. Yay. See, everybody is getting a little peek behind the curtain here. <laughs> okay, to be fair, I have been away from the country for 20 days and Coming back now, my brain is still in. <laughs> my brain is still in London. I'm very There's excited for your talk. Time zone. Yeah, and it's it's Friday, so you know nobody's brains are expected to be online after that sort of lovely vacation. Yeah. No, I'm here. I'm here for the snails and slimy tails. I'm mm -hmm. ready. Yes, we are very excited for Christie's talk today. Uh, Dr. Versace is a passionate STEM educator, paleontologist, and mom. Her research ranges from the study of marine life in the fossil record to the conservation of modern biota to promoting learning at the intersection of science and culture. She has won numerous awards for excellence in instruction, mentoring, and research with her students, which is part of the reason we are so excited to have her here today, in addition to snails and slimy tails and all of that jazz. Um, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat as always. We've been away for a while, but the format hasn't changed. So go ahead and put those questions in the chat and we will get to as many as we can after Christy's presentation. So whenever you are ready, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you so much. Thank you everyone who is listening, watching. I'm really excited to share my love of mollusks with you and my journey in paleontology. So let me begin that journey uh, by saying a long time ago in rural New Jersey, far, far away, I was clearly enjoying 80s apparel um, by that photo there, but uh, had a gravel driveway and Wait, Christy. Oh, sorry, yeah. I we're you're you're only sh you're showing PowerPoint, not the not the presentation. What? We're not. I I'm seeing only the PowerPoint app, not the presentation currently. Oh dear, I am sh showing the slide on my thing. So hmm. Let's try that again. Sorry, folks. <laughs> again, we're 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 just coming back from uh, <clears throat> from things. We're getting moment. back into the swing of things. Um, our last episode that was live was like February, wasn't yeah, it? It was a long. It was a while. It's been several months. So, I did the same. Could you see this? The the title slide as the main screen. No, before. I I was able to see um, like PowerPoint, not like, not like the thing, the presentation. If, if try again, you're... maybe maybe I'll do something else. Let me let me try okay. let me try this instead. Let's see if this works. I'm gonna just share my entire screen for a second. Does that work? There you go. Okay. All right. There we go. Now you're back. Okay, Wonderful. everybody. Go back on. Go back. There we this go. Is, this is back to so um <laughs> little known fact. I used to do musical theater before my life in science, even some professional musical theater. So, you know, this is just take two here. <laughs> okay. So can you see this slide? Yes, you are good to go. Okay, just making sure before I, I start my story again. Um, a long time ago in rural New Jersey, far, far away, I was sitting on my gravel driveway in the northwest part of the state, and I found a fossil. I was about four or five years old. This is in the mid 80s. I apparently took rocks to kindergarten for show and tell. 
And when I found this fossil, a shell in the rock, which is called a brachiopod, essentially it's kind of similar to a clam, but was really popular a hundred million years ago, a few hundred million years ago, um, versus now where they're still around, but clams are way more popular. So I found one of these, was curious about it. My parents took me to a museum, we figured out what it was, and so kind of began my interest in fossils, although I didn't necessarily plan on becoming a paleontologist, but I kept opening doors um, because clearly I was interested in that path. So we went to museums, we joined fossil clubs, I spent a lot of time at the Jersey Shore and you know looked at modern shells and all sorts of cool invertebrates. And one of the things that was really great growing up was when my family would go on these trips with fossil clubs linked to museums and different organizations. And my brother, who's also in a wheelchair, could um, join in on the fossil collecting with us. So it was a really great family activity and something I encourage folks to do if you're interested in fossils. You can check out My Fossil, which can link you to communities of advocational and professional paleontologists to see if there's clubs near you. So here begins my paleontologist journey. Uh, when I went to school, I went to Colgate in New York for my BA in geology. Then if you know that uh, mascot over there, Syracuse University for my master's, and then a PhD in marine biology at UNC Wilmington. And part of the reason I wanted to study both geology and biology was because as a paleontologist, I really wanna understand ancient ecosystems and ancient life which, if I look at it in the modern as well, can give me a better sense of what's going on in the past. I had three amazing women mentors, Dr. Connie Soja, Dr. Linda Ivany, and Dr. Trisha Kelly. And right after I finished, I went to Georgia State, where I'm now a faculty member, undergraduate director in the Department of Geosciences in Atlanta. Before I get more into the work I'm doing now, I also want to give a shout out to other parts of my journey because that really shaped my experiences. And that was at the Paleontological Research Institution was my first kind of internship focused on mollusks. So it really kind of helped solidify my future research directions. Also the Calvert Marine Museum, which was my first internship in paleontology. And I just could not believe that they were gonna actually pay me to study fossil shark teeth as part of a summer research experience. So that was wonderful. And um, I've also done some work with the National Park Service doing fossil surveys and thinking about um, promoting our paleontological resources on public lands, protecting them and so on. So I like to mention these different experiences because if you're out there and you're interested in something like paleontology or another type of STEM field, if you can get these kinds of short-term experiences in different places, they can be really amazing. And this is also my pitch to support your museums, such as the Alpha Museum and Western Science Center and so many of these great um, organizations and places for doing all the work that they do. So up there on the top right, I have um, the Gilbert D. Snail that PRI is promoting and uh, he does science road trips. And so I'll take you on my own road trip there. As part of that journey, um, even though usually you hear, you know, all the exciting stories and successes, I do also want to mention that, unfortunately, I have faced harassment, um, imposter syndrome, self-doubt. This is a copy of my transcript from my first semester in college, and my very first geology class was my worst grade that semester. So if you feel like, you know, you're passionate about something, but maybe you're not excelling in it right away, don't let that, um, you know, stop your, your enthusiasm. Part of uh, the reason that I was able to persist through different struggles, including when I first looked at doctoral programs and then had to back out of my application because of um, some mean behavior from some people at the school I wanted to go to, you know, I was really down about that. But groups like the Association for Women Geoscientists, um, who helped me get support and opportunities are really awesome. So just make sure you, you find your village also to help you on your path. 
And that's part of the reason I'm so passionate about trying to help others. And this is a quick shout out to a new collaboration I'm helping to develop for student opportunities to work on fossil projects for uh, the National Park Service. So stay tuned. The official launch will be in the next week or so. Okay. So now that you have the context of where I've come from, I'm gonna take you under the sea with some of my favorite cast of invertebrate characters here from SpongeBob and of course, Gary the Snail and tell you why I love mollusks so much. So they have a great fossil record. They have been around for half a billion years. They're incredibly diverse, second only to arthropods in terms of major animal phyla. They have all different types of lifestyles. They're found all over the world from Antarctica to high mountains. Uh, they're really important for different aspects of the economy, whether that is for seafood industry or as the picture in the middle shows there, um, snail slime that is used for beauty products. They also have different lifestyles. So some are carnivores, some are herbivores, some uh, filter feed in the water and take little particles of food. Uh, and are really important for the ecosystems in that way. They have really interesting patterns of evolution and they can tell us something about human impacts if we look at their existence today. So I have studied mollusks in both fossil and modern environments, and I'm gonna share a little bit about both of those things here. Before I get into talking about shells in particular and why they're so useful, I love this cartoon which for um, those who remember the Occupy Wall Street movement, this is a great example of how oftentimes when we hear about paleontology in the fossil record, we hear about all the cool vertebrates like dinosaurs and mastodons, but special shout out to the invertebrates, those animals without a backbone, um, because there are so many different types of them and they're so awesome to study in the modern and the fossil record. So just, make sure you give some love to the invertebrates like your mollusks. So the stories that shells can tell uh, can be really wide ranging. You can look at traces on the shells as you can see from some of the pictures here. We have a repair scar there in the middle on that gastropod shell. In the upper right, we have um, holes from a boring sponge that encrusted over that clam shell. We have a crab about to attack and open the snail shell at the bottom right. We can measure the thickness of shells to look at how they're responding to certain conditions. And then in the lower left, we actually have um, brachiopods with drill holes, but many of our modern clams have drill holes, which I'll, I'll talk about today. We can see all of these kinds of things in fossils that are hundreds of millions of years old to the modern. So we can tell stories about what happened in the past, how these organisms may have changed due to different environmental or ecological conditions. We can cut up shells and do geochemical analyses to look at aspects of the environment and how it was changing at that time. So there's a lot of great information recorded in shells and because of those hard parts, they're readily preserved in the fossil record and they're abundant to study. How you can read shells, you can look at the shape, you can look at the ornamentation, do they have lots of ridges or spikes on them? You can look at gastropod shells in the fossil record or in the modern and tell if a hermit crab later inhabited that shell and carried it around because of all the encrusting that happens. You can look at signs of attack from different types of organisms. So that middle picture the um, clam with the perfectly circular hole in the middle. You've probably seen these on the beach and thought maybe, oh, I could make a necklace out of this. Um, that's actually from a snail that drilled through the clam and ate it for dinner. Um, we also call these boring snails, but you know, even though they're boring, they're actually fascinating. And um, on the lower right corner, you can see a picture of what's called an incomplete drill hole or borehole. And so that's a failed attempt where the clam was able to escape and didn't end up as a gastropod's meal. Sometimes we see repair scars. Also uh, on the bottom, I have a picture of an oyster catcher, which makes a very characteristic V-shaped notch in the clams that it eats. 
So lots of different cool things to tell from the traces on shells. Why I'm interested in studying shells um, in the fossil record is because there's been all of these groups of predators over time that in different ways have preyed on mollusks. And you can see that over the last several hundred million years, different groups have kind of diversified and radiated and um, different attack strategies have come about putting increased predation pressure on these mollusks. So I'll stop for a minute and tell a bit about different types of predators that um, snails can be. So in this image, uh, in these images here, you can see on the left is uh, the horse conch, which is kind of the top predatory snail on a mudflat. And it's actually preying on another type of snail, the lightning whelk, which is also a carnivore. In the middle, we have a moon snail at top and um, a myricid or oyster drill at the bottom. And these are the types of snails that drill those holes through their shells of the victims. On the top right, we have a tulip snail that uses the edge of its shell sometimes to pry open uh, bivalves. And then in the bottom right is the cone snail, which you may have heard about, that has that harpoon and shoots a toxin into its prey. And these are actually um, substances that are being studied for their pain relief properties because they're so potent. So if we look back in geologic time, we can see that there's this period called the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, where all the intensity of predation increases from all different types of groups that have come about. And um, this is partly what I'm interested in, in looking at those trends of predator-prey interactions through time. So you're probably wondering, how do they do it? You're saying snails drill these holes in the shell. Well, those two groups I mentioned, the moon snails and the oyster drills, they have similar ways that they do it, um, although they're actually uh, not really closely related. It was a case of convergent evolution and they evolved the ability to do so independently. They have what's called an ABO or accessory boring organ that secretes a solution that's acidic and has chelating agents that picks away a part at the shell. And then they have a, a scraping mechanism, a radula, where you can see the, the teeth from that on the left there that then scratches away at that softened shell. And in the case of the moon snail, it wraps its foot around it, uh, holds it tight and starts drilling in a single spot. And it actually goes in kind of quarter turns, um, the radula uh, as it's drilling through to make that beautiful beveled hole you see on the lower left. And we can look at the size of the holes and tell something about the size of the predator for the moon snails, where the hole is drilled on the clams, and if that's changed over time, have the predators gotten more effective at where they're drilling? So lots of really interesting questions. So the first kind of area of research I'll share with you is looking at some of those predation patterns in space and time. And um, there's different types of data we can look at. We can look at the diversity of these different snails and clams and how that has changed. So how many different species, how abundant they are in different places, what they're doing, uh, are the different um, players on the stage kind of changing, but doing the same thing. And then how have they been changing over time with evolution? So to answer some of those questions, oftentimes you have to use both studies in the modern and from the fossil record to kind of see what you can learn from those different types of data sources. One uh, area of work I've done is to look at the question of whether different temperatures or seasonality affects the intensity of that drilling process and therefore the drilling frequency that we see. So if we're counting up the number of drill holes we see in a collection of fossils, is that really reflective of what happened? If we had a different collection from a different latitude that was a lot warmer, would we expect it to be higher because metabolisms are faster in warmer temperatures? So I conducted field and lab experiments where I planted clams in a mud flat that had a lot of moon snails and also had them in the lab to see, are there any differences? Does it nicely work out where yes, in the warmest conditions, we see the most predation. And what I discovered was actually that 
depending on if you were looking at data from the lab or the field, you got very different sets of information. And if you can see the graph here in the summer, a huge percentage of the clams that I fed to those moon snails were drilled, whereas we had no drilled shells whatsoever recovered from the mud flats in the summer. And we think there's a few different reasons for this. You know, in the lab, it kind of nicely followed what we would expect from temperature, but in the field, there's other things going on. There's heat stress and clams dying. There's a lot of uh, shell crushing predators like crabs and birds that might be getting to those snails or the clams first the snails might be stressed out and not eating as much. So just an interesting story in terms of getting different kinds of information from different ways to ask the question about whether temperature and seasonality affect drilling. I also looked at whether these moon snails were perhaps behaving differently in the lab. There were some hints that maybe the mucus might be anesthetizing and killing the clams before they could be drilled, therefore leading to inaccurate information about drills. Uh, maybe there wasn't enough sediment in the lab for the moon snails to kind of be moving around and burrow to actually drill the clams like they do in nature. So I did some experiments and what we found was that it didn't matter how deep the sediment was. Sure, sometimes they got confused and they'd just be carrying around that clam in the back of um, their body forever before they could figure out how to situate themselves to drill it because they couldn't go down into the sand. But over um, the majority of the clams in the experiments were drilled regardless of the sediment depth. And it was really more things like clam health or other situations that led to um, shells that had been consumed without drill holes in them. And then kind of the third area of this research was looking at modern ecosystems and latitudinal patterns. Because in the fossil record, if I wanna study predation over the last hundred million years, it's really hard to get great fossil samples all from the same kind of place. You might have some in more Northern environments and some in more Southern environments. And then does that mean that there were different temperatures and environmental conditions at that time where you can't really easily compare them. But in the modern, if you just go down a coastline of beaches and those shells that are accumulating on the beaches are very similar to the kinds of processes where shells are accumulating in the fossil record, then perhaps that could serve as a proxy to help us figure out, are there major differences in predation intensity along latitudinal gradients that can help us think about how to address some of these potential biases we might be seeing in the fossil record. So I went to Brazil and Argentina to do this along the South American coastline because it has such a great continuous coastline and it hadn't yet been studied there. And as you can see, the field work kind of varied. Sometimes I was enjoying the very nice weather um, and other times it was more uh, frigid down in Patagonia. But bonus when you're in Patagonia, sometimes your field locality has penguins, which was pretty amazing to see. So that was kind of fun. And what we discovered, at least for South America, we found an increase in those predator prey interactions up towards the tropics. So that helps us look into the fossil record and say, okay, things like temperature, things like seasonality, um, the different types of predators and prey that might be there, we have to think carefully about those different factors that might influence these long-term trends we're trying to address and understanding uh, the evolution of these different predator prey systems through time. The second area of research I'd like to briefly share about is more related to the sixth extinction. And so our modern biodiversity crisis and species loss we have today, in large part due to human impacts. We're destroying habitats, we're affecting species ranges, leading to invasive species with our own transportation, pollution, climate, et cetera. If we can use the fossil record to examine how organisms and communities respond to natural environmental change without human influence, that may be able to tell us something about how better to address conservation issues today. Or are there types of data or approaches that we can use from kind of our training in paleontology and apply those to modern systems to again, 
better think about how to address conservation issues. So this subfield of paleontology is called conservation paleobiology. And I've been really uh, enjoying getting to do some of this work with some of my students in different ways. One area is looking at plioplacine extinctions where lots of marine organisms had um, turnover and went extinct and changed over the last few million years. So we go to outcrops, we collect samples, we sieve out the mud and the sediment, we pick all the shells from uh, what is recovered and then try to identify them and look at what's there in what abundances are they there? What kind of predatory, um, predator-prey interactions are we seeing? And how does that change across extinction episodes? Another area of work relates to what are called live dead assemblages. And this is where you go out and either by digging or by trawling, you can, or dredging, you can collect uh, bulk samples of modern mollusks, either ones that are still living in the community or ones that have died and those shells are accumulating in the surface and compare what you're seeing in the live assemblages versus those dead shells. Are you seeing the same kinds of things? As you go deeper down into the sediment, are you seeing a change in the kinds of snails and clams that are there because of perhaps human influence? So you can look at the relative abundance of those um, and different time scales to try to see how humans might have impacted ecosystems as noticed by the change in these snail and clam communities. So it's these kinds of approaches that largely paleontologists are doing, but applying in modern ecosystems. And then finally, what was my pandemic pivot? Because I couldn't go to the lab, I couldn't go out in the field. I live in Atlanta, which is surrounded by metamorphic and igneous rock. Uh, I started working on modern land snails and slugs with my colleague Jan Vendetti, who's at the Natural History Museum in LA. There's a project there. If you are from Southern California, you may know of it called Slime, Snails and Slugs Living in Metropolitan Environments, where anyone can take photos and upload them to iNaturalist, where citizen scientists, professionals all help identify the snails and slugs you're seeing, and that can give us a better understanding of the diversity in an area, how that's changing through time with potentially invasive species. So while Jan and I were talking early on in the pandemic, I really wanted some projects to get outside with my students and also my two adorable field assistants over there in the picture at the top right. You know, once we finished virtual school, I wanted to get out in nature. And so we started looking at the land snail and slug communities around us. And it has just been fascinating and a research project that has really grown uh, in the last two years. Two of the slugs that you see there at the top are uh, common in certain parts of Atlanta, and yet they're not yet officially documented here. So it's just exciting what you can find once you actually start going out and looking for it. And we would have never really done all this much work if kind of the conditions of being able to do research hadn't changed. That top right slug there, Arian, also I wanna tell a slimy tale about that. It has a very strong uh, slime and, and snails and slugs, by the way, you know, slime's used for different purposes. It's composed mostly of water, but other components. And it helps protect and moisturize the surface of uh, the body as it's moving across different textures. Sometimes it's used to find mates. Sometimes it's used to track and find its way home. Sometimes it's used for defense. And so with this taxon, Arian, it's very strong and sticky. And so it's a defense mechanism where it has this orange stained, um, really strong, sticky, but flexible mucus. And the medical community uh, has been interested in creating a kind of adhesive for surgeries that mimics kind of the way that the slime of that slug works, which I just think is so fascinating. So wanted to share that story. So I hope you have enjoyed a, a brief look into my world where I work in both modern and ancient ecosystems, kind of straddling the boundary between biology and geology, bridging that gap in terms of my interests in paleontology. And I also wanted to say that, you know, the research that I do is really just one piece of what I do 
I really am passionate about teaching, mentoring, STEM education and outreach, supporting historically uh, excluded groups in science. And so um, doing that kind of work, doing the science with students and helping the next generation is what I really love to do. And if anyone's interested in the same kinds of things I'm interested in and, and wants to just you know, pick my brain about your future career directions, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm also uh, very active in the National Association of Geoscience Teachers. So educators, if any of you are listening, also feel free to um, come find me. If you're on Twitter, at snail underscore and underscore C is where you will see me. And with that, I would like to thank you uh, and some of the funders for the research I mentioned. And that cartoon there is a, a very accurate description of the hundreds and thousands of shells I may be collecting and counting, um, whether officially as part of research or just for fun when I go places. Thank you. <laughs> I like that comic. <laughs> Okay, we can't hear you. Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Oh, we can I hear you. Me. There, there we go. <laughs> I was gonna say that that comic is very accurate for scientists on vacation because even yes. when we <laughs> were on vacation just recently, we decided to go visit geolo uh, famous historical geological sites like Sikar Point, where they discovered where uh, you where have the to. unconformity, mm -hmm. like yeah, and like we were looking at fossils everywhere. I remember. I forgot what museum we were at and I looked down at the floor and I was like, there's, there's fossils in the tiles of the floor. And it was just like, you can't stop being a scientist sometimes. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the natural history museum in Atlanta, Fernbank museum of natural history, the, the floors are, uh, Jurassic limestone. It's the See, Solenhofen cool. style. And it's just, so cool to be in there mm -hmm. on the floors. But even if you go, you know, I'm randomly, well, maybe not now, but you know, in the 90s when I was going to malls more often, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes you would see in the bathroom, like on the stalls or on the floors, you would see fossils there too. So yeah, it's it's everywhere. I mean, I like going to the beach too and just like picking up sand and looking mm -hmm. what, what grains are in there and like what kind of shell or whatever was found. Mm -hmm. If I see like a clump of like seaweed at the beach, I mean, like I would love, to, I like going in and like seeing what I can find even though like i'm like picking up very daintily because i just don't like getting my hands super dirty but i like to see what's in there we we just got back from a vacation where um i collected lots of empty snail egg cases on the Ooh. beach that i found because i thought oh, these would just be such great teaching specimens and so <laughs> Can't we turn it off. For, for the collections for teaching specimens as part of vacation <laughs> and since my husband is also a geologist um we, you know, conversations and vacations are usually very science and nature themed. <laughs> um, so I, one, I love this presentation. Also parts of it were horrifying when you really, <laughs> when you really start thinking about it and the boring, like the boring holes into shells and everything, it's a horror show. It's awesome. <laughs> um, I didn't even say, I, I forgot to mention that usually oh. what happens is the clam right? The clam is still alive mm -hmm. while it's being drilled, obviously. And then the snail sticks its proboscis down in there and puts down some digestive enzymes and starts kind of half digesting it while it's alive before it sucks it back up to eat it. So yes, horrifying. Cool. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, I had a question in regards to uh, the, the subfield of conservation uh, paleobiology that you mentioned, which I think is a fascinating subfield. One uh, question I had is how do you account for, you know, wildly different, you know, there's huge amounts of spans of time between what you're seeing in the fossil record and organisms and systems now. So in conservation paleobiology, how do you account for that? Like, how do you make inferences from the fossil record and apply it to ecosystems and organisms today and know you're on the right track? Mm -hmm. Good question. So I think that oftentimes if we're using data from both modern ecosystems and uh, the fossil record, it's usually different types of data or asking different questions because we've got different time scales. You know, mm -hmm. on the fossil record, we're, we're thinking more on evolutionary time scales 
and how communities and organisms are changing over long spans of time. In the modern, um, you know, biologists are, are usually just working on decades, maybe hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. Uh, so it's, it's not so much a one-to-one -one comparison, but that different types of data used to help address different parts of questions are pulled from those different sources. Like, for, you know, like, I think it's really cool because like a lot of folks, when they think about paleontology, we're just looking at dead dinosaurs or whatever, <laughs> but it, it's it's really cool to see that you are using the past to better understand like the present and the future as well but you know you are studying modern specimens as well it's it's like a lot of folks don't realize that paleontology doesn't limit us to just one very specific time period in earth's grand history a lot of what we learn can go towards helping the future as well right yeah, and I think that's one of the really exciting things about paleontology. Um, too often, you know, people just think it's more like stamp collecting and specimens collecting dust somewhere, but there's so much useful information to be gained, um, not only to understand the past, but then what we can learn in thinking about the future, especially considering all the changes the world is undergoing now with human influences. And mollusks, when, of course, as you just saw, are a great yeah. way to do that. <laughs> I mean, that's one thing I was going to ask too. With like mollusks, I from what I know is like mollusks are really good indicators of change. Is that right? Even through geologic time? Yeah, and I think it depends on the type of mollusk too. You know, you have something like oysters, uh, where you've got different, slightly different types of oyster lifestyle. Some just lay there on the sediment. Some are cemented to rock. Um, but there's certain kinds of questions you can ask using oysters that are really restricted to certain types of environments where they live and the oyster reefs that accumulate. And there's some really interesting work in conservation paleobiology being done looking at um, historical uh, oyster reefs because we can see that essentially, um, for example, in the Chesapeake Bay and Rowan Lockwood is doing this work, a lot of those specimens were much larger. And so the, the catches and the harvests, um, you know, the oysters were allowed to grow to much larger. And we're, we're seeing the impacts of um, collecting, uh, over collecting uh, by having oysters that don't grow to such maturity and, and, and don't get as big. But then there's other types of um, mollusks where in the, the shell, you know, the information they're recording geochemically is telling us a lot about change. Some mollusks are really resistant to change, so th they're happy wherever, so maybe they're less useful to, to notice about change, but others might be really sensitive. Does, does like when, um... Does the drilling, like, because you kind of showed a little bit, but like, does the drilling, wait, I know, I know I'm trying to say, hold on. So if like, when, okay, so as OC, if ocean acidification, you know, like shells can become thinner and stuff, does that weirdly make it easier for predatory snails to like decimate populations as well? Yeah, um, oh, wow. I think that is certainly a possibility you would just have to also think about, yes, if shells are, you know, just like corals, having trouble making their skeletons, then that could be a problem with them if they're thinner and more susceptible to predation. But if it's those drilling snails, you know, are they also having trouble making their snail shell? And do they need to invest more energy into their shell to protect them from other predators? Um, so, so there might be a, uh, you know, a bunch of different questions to look at in that regard to say, you know, how is it impacting the, the, the predators because they're also struggling from that ocean acidification or, or could potentially. Every time we have a new guest on the show, I want to change careers because like <laughs> you inspire like all these, every guest, and especially you is like inspires all these really cool questions I have of like the world around us. And like, I want to help and learn too, because like, 
it's just there's so many like amazing things that we can learn about but also it's like you know with climate change and all the things that are happening it, it kind of makes you want to do more in a way mm -hmm. I mean, for me you know yeah and yeah. also i'm just as a vertebrate paleontologist i'm just jealous of invert paleontologists and your massive data sets <laughs> You guys have so true. many, so many shells. It's true. It's 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 good and bad, right? Like my master's thesis, I think I looked at twenty four thousand shells. Ooh, um, you know, just a few, just a couple, just a few. Yeah. So we have lots of great data that um, from all those specimens that can help us be confident. But then it it's pretty labor intensive too. <laughs> I can imagine. What's it like having like? Do you have to have a plan to like, okay, I'm going to look at this many shells today and have the for this week, or is it some days you're just like, I did one. That's enough. for me. I think, I think there's definitely a, a strategy where, you know, sometimes you're in the groove and you can be like, all right, I'm going to get through, you know, five samples today. Every sample has about a hundred shells. I could do that. And other days you're like, Today is not one of those days. <laughs> you can look at lots and lots of shells. <laughs> the importance is knowing the difference between those two days. <laughs> right. And then you're like, how can I be productive in some other way today? Because <laughs> it's not going to be doing this. <laughs> um, earlier in your presentation, which I thought was very cool as somebody who also struggled with certain subjects in college, you posted your transcript and it's like, look, this was the most difficult class I had. And here I am as a paleontologist. Um, what would you, what sort of advice recommendations would you give to people who are struggling in these subjects that they feel really passionate about? Like I, I've been pretty open about the fact that I've always struggled with math. Um, hasn't stopped me from being a paleontologist, but it can be demoralizing when you're in an academic institution and you, you know, you're being graded and it's difficult to figure out, like, can I do this career if I'm having these kinds of difficulties? So like, I just wanted to know if you'd like to expand more on that and like what advice you would give for people who are kind of finding themselves in the same situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, there's a few different things to think about. So one is that um, I always say to maintain your enthusiasm, right? If you're really, passionate about something, if you're really interested in something, then perhaps the setting in which you were learning that subject was not conducive for you to be learning because of whatever. Maybe, you know, for all of you in the last few years, maybe it's because there was a pandemic going on and like life has been stressful. Um, <laughs> or even just in the college years when you're also trying to find yourself and figure things out, right? There's, there's a lot going on there. Um, but I have always been a big believer in community, and I know that so much of kind of my persistence in different ways has been because people believed in me. Um, you know, maybe if I wasn't strong in one thing, maybe uh, someone could help me realize that I was strong somewhere else. And then maybe when I got more confidence in that area, then I could try to tackle something else with a different, you know, support system. But I, I often tell my students, you know, I, I was not a straight A student in college, which they, they totally think because I'm a professor, I must have just had a perfect record. But, um, you know, I didn't even post my worst grades in geology there. That was just my first semester. <laughs> um, but I, oh, and like, in science, chemistry is actually where I had the strongest grades growing up. It seemed to just make so much sense to me, right? You, add this and this and you get that. But I wasn't passionate about that. So I found people in biology, in geology and paleontology who, you know, made me excited, who believed in me. And even if I wasn't the best student at the time or I was struggling with it, you know, they saw that I was curious. They saw that I was thinking, that I was trying. And I think those kinds of things go a long way because you're not if, if you know all the answers, you know, you're not just succeeding, you know, you, you learn through the failures and not knowing things as well. So, so having that community and good mentorship is, is really great. Yeah. I had to take physics twice and I almost failed out of biochemistry because I hated that class. Absolutely. It was the worst class I ever took. And I did not give, I did not care at all for that class. <laughs> But I had to retake it, so I found a teacher, a tutor, 
helped me pass with a with a C, but I made it through <laughs> just fine. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes that's what you got to do. And then you find your your strength somewhere else. You know? <laughs> and and sometimes there's room to grow. And sometimes if it's not bringing you joy, you say, you know what? I don't need to be an expert. <laughs> I just need to know enough to talk to the experts in that. One hundred percent. Yeah, I'm still had quite a few difficulties with math when I was growing up. Uh, it's a miracle I made it through my college algebra class, and I'm pretty sure the professor gave me a pity grade. But it was fine because it hasn't really impacted me, my actual professional career. It just means I wasn't particularly good at learning math in a college setting. <laughs> well, I think there's like this weird perception, right, of like mm -hmm. that as a scientist, you have to be good at all aspects of STEM. Like you mm -hmm. have to be able to do, I, don't, I can't think of a math term right now. Like <laughs> Geometry. Like, There's a math term. I, I have the symbol in my head. It's like the weird long S. What is that thing called? The, um, like for differential equations. Differential equations. Yeah. In calculus. Yeah. Yeah. There's Integral. like an expectation. Integral. Yeah. There you go. There's like an expectations that we have to be able to do that, but like, we're all all scientists are different and have, like you said, Christy, like different expertise and interests and stuff. It's. I, I I really wish we could change that perception of like, you have to be good at everything to be a scientist. I mean, like for you who, you know, you do a lot of amazing work in education as a big fan of your work in education. Like, how do you think we can help to change that perception in, in folks who think that they don't belong in our field because of that? Having more uh, Fossil Friday chats and... <laughs> <laughs> People like all of us who are who are trying to, you know, just capture that excitement kids already have about science and, you know, support them better when they are struggling in different ways. Um, you know, I yeah, like physics, not my strong suit. Um, higher math, not my strong suit. But the types of paleontology and ecology research I do, I don't need to have that as much. And as I said, if I do, I just talk to the folks who, you know, that's their jam. And then we each bring different um, expertise to the table. As a, as a paleontologist once told me, that's what co-authors are for. <laughs> <laughs> yes, find great collaborators. That, mm -hmm. that for sure mm -hmm. is, is key. Recognizing where your strengths do not lie and finding someone who's like, oh, actually, Love that. Let me do it. And, and it's more know, fun. Right? It is. Yeah. And, and I mean, I love, I love being, being that yourself. Yeah. I mean, I love being that for other people too. It's like, oh, I love this kind of stuff. Let me add it. You know? I make, I make some really, I made really good friends like collaborating mm -hmm. with people. Like after we're done, like we become friends because we talk about other things outside mm -hmm. of paleontology. Although our, most paleontology friends that I have, our conversations do somehow end up being about fossils at one point, we do talk about other things because, you know, you made the really cool, strong connection with somebody. Yeah. And I, I know that in my kind of journey, um, women, and then especially more recently, moms have been great to have in my academic community because there is more stuff I really need to talk about and figure out <laughs> aside <laughs> from the science. Uh, so, you know, with Jan at the LA Museum, you know, this slug project has just been so much fun because she and I were undergraduates together and we both ended up going to study mollusks, which was not planned, but that's what happened. And so now we're like, oh, cool, we can hang out and we can do science together. This is like the best <laughs> ever. <laughs> I, I, I mean, Brittany and I are good friends. We host mm -hmm. the show, but we're also like friends outside. We play yeah. D&D &D together. Yeah. Things talk like about that. work and then we'll talk about something else. So usually, something usually, dirty. usually, if we start talking about work, someone, one of our other friends, has to like, like say, like, stop, stop. please, <laughs> <laughs> like, completely nerd out on me right now. Just <laughs> paint it in. <laughs> um, speaking about your slime project, really quick, uh, Christy, like, is that a citizen science project? Is there a way for folks to get involved in that? Because that sounds really fun to me. Yes. So I would. I. I mean, I love iNaturalist. is such a great app download it. It's free. It's awesome. Take photos, go out in nature, explore, make your own discoveries, as it said on the TV show. Um, 
because I even like when I'm walking in the neighborhood, uh, oh, what is that flower in somebody's garden? Let me at least identify what it is. I won't add it to the database because I know it's in someone's garden, but you know, I'm learning so much more just from using the app. If you are in uh, Southern California, then you can, when you add, yes, check. When you add um, a photo of a land snail or slug to iNaturalist, it's automatically captured by that slime project there. And then I created a similar project for Atlanta. Um, so folks here can do that. But even if there's not an official slime project, there are so many projects in iNaturalist. There's one looking at spiders. There's ones looking at fungi, right? There's all these different types of um, projects that scientists or, you know, uh, community organizations or folks are doing in iNaturalist. So when you're adding that, you're adding data to our understanding of diversity. The app's called iNaturalist. There's also an app called iSeq, which is by the same group. And that one's a, a bit more, um, I think, uh, I think less of the scientific community is as involved in that because it's more about just, I think, identifying things for your interest. I've not used that one as much, but really, I, I highly recommend it. Um, check it out. <laughs> I, I actually started using Seek a lot for like plant identification because it's mm -hmm. really, really nice. And I've become a lover of plants in the last couple of years. And so every time I'm out, if I see something I don't notice, I just open up Seek. It's great. The also the cool part too is if you use Seek, you can connect it to iNaturalist, so that when you do an identification on Seek, it automatically can add that identification to iNaturalist. So you're adding more data sets, more cool. data to the data set. So yeah, and if you need to, you know, check to make sure that it's not poison ivy. <laughs> you oh can yeah, do that that's it. Using the app. <laughs> Or are those actually the chanterelle mushrooms I'm interested in? Uh, oh, goodness. Right now. <laughs> you, know, you can feel a little more confident. Definitely get an expert in the case of the fungi, but. <laughs> Wait, so you do fun you do mushroom foraging too, Christy? Yes. <gasps> that's cool. Okay, I, that's a whole I'm not other an conversation. Expert. I don't have much more to share on that. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, th that, I just recently bought a book about fungi because that. that my weird plant to like okay i know fungi aren't mushrooms aren't plants but my somehow it led me down to that and now i'm just like obsessed with like how people identify mushrooms and the mushroom culture that i didn't really know existed <laughs> until recently so yeah anyway that's a whole different story yeah that's cool though i i love that <laughs> all right i think we're just about out of time brit yep. um so christy thank you so much for joining yes, us on you. fossil friday chats today like We've been ha wanting to have you on the show for so long and you did not disappoint. I'm going to say it and embarrass you really quick. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of all the amazing work that you do. And I'm so, so excited and grateful that you decided to be on Fossil Friday Chat today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Big fans of you and Brittany and all this stuff. I mean, as I said, I've been watching the Fossil Friday Chats and being like, oh, I would love to go on that someday. <laughs> you know what's happened, finally. You knew. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, so we have inspired some folks to, uh, you know, feel feel a little more love for for the snails and clams that they come across. <laughs> oh, I absolutely will be now. <laughs> um, so we like to end the show really quick. If you have any little bit of advice for any future paleontologist, what's the one piece of advice you'd love to give them? Oh, uh, I think good mentors. Good mentors just really make a difference because then... You have folks who support you, who can guide you to the right person. If they don't know the answer to a question, they can tell you about opportunities that you can pursue in the field. They can, um, you know, when you're frustrated or struggling, they can help lift you up. I know that so much of my journey has been, you know, a, a positive experience because of those various people in my life who've, who've helped shepherd me along the way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christy. And thank you so much everybody for joining us at home on the return of fossil Friday <laughs> chat season four, four, I think is where we're at now. Um, Goodness. as always, if you like this program and want to support programs like it at the Alpha museum and Western science center, you can find links on how to do that below. 
And make sure you like and subscribe to our channel for more stories from the world of paleontology. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you in two weeks.